Okay, I just came in from being outside. It's about 3 a.m. Um, I discovered uh, some of the team outside by the big tent had, uh, well, they were outside uh, scrambling, and all of their stuff is blowing all over the glacier practically. We think the gusts have been about uh, probably 40 miles an hour, and uh, it's pretty intense, <laughs> to say the least. The weather was actually not our biggest worry when we started this trip. We were about to spend five days in the belly of one of America's most active volcanoes, and we had other concerns. Yeah, it's fraught with hazards. Geothermal holes, crevasses, falling rocks, avalanches, poison gas out of certain vents, just to name a few. <laughs> This crater is possibly the most dangerous landscape in America, and for that reason, it's strictly off limits to the public. This trip is the exception. Eddie Cartaya is one of the most accomplished cave explorers in the country, and he and his team were given special permission to investigate something new on Mount St. Helens. It's a cave system that no one has ever entered before. And you're just like, oh my God, this is so incredible. You just feel sucked into it. You don't even want to wait for a rope. You just want to just go in there and we got to get in there, see how deep that thing is. Where does it go? What's in there? What, what's being hidden in there? I mean, but you got to wait and do it right. Hello, hello. How you doing, man? Good to see you, man. Oregon Field Guide was invited to document this expedition because we had experience caving with Eddie. In 2013, we joined Eddie and his partner Brent McGregor on Mount Hood for a groundbreaking expedition to map the largest glacier cave in the lower 48 states. Since then, the two have been seeking out other unexplored caves throughout the Northwest. But pursuing caves in an active volcano is a different kind of crazy. The massive 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens made all the headlines, but even smaller eruptions, like this one in 2004, left a big mark on the volcano. The very spot where that eruption sent ash thousands of feet in the sky is now a huge magma dome in what was a flat section of crater. It's also our camp. What we're sitting on is the end of the old dome that was formed right after the first eruption. Directly behind you and in front of me is the new dome, which grew just a few years ago. The geothermal center of this volcano is sitting right behind the camera. <laughs> Where we sleep, our beds are warm because the rocks underneath are basically baking the tent from the underside. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Duct that one together. Yeah. You can actually put your clothes under your thermal rest and dry your clothes. <laughs> That's what I found out. That's crazy. All right, guys, so uh, we'll get started. So welcome to Camp Rembrandt on Mount St. Helens. Most of what you see is steam. Yesterday, we did identify one for sure sulfur vent. We'll have to think about how many we send down. Eddie's assembled a team that has a lifetime of experience dealing with the dangers of caving, mountaineering, climbing, and search and rescue. But in the caves, we also face toxic volcanic gases that can kill in an instant. Can you see that? Hold that up to where you can see the, 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 the meter. Can you see that? Thanks, Dave. When it's working, there's always going to be air flowing in. We're only going to use them if the entrance in the cave run into some bad atmosphere. Maybe the volcano burps and the gas gets worse. Then this will be a rescue only. We're not going to use these to go in and explore. It looks on the surface that, you know, why would we be doing this? To see a glacier, one of the few glaciers in the world that's growing, where all else is melting. There's a real fascination in what's different about this glacier. Why is it here? Why is it growing the way it's growing? On top of one of the most active volcanoes in the world. It's a unique combination of fire and ice. It, should, it looks pretty flat, guys. You know something interesting, fascinating, has to be going on with the interface of two forces like that. 
Even before they get to the caves, the team has to pass what we call the shooting gallery. The 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens did more than just send ash out into the sky. It also blasted unstable cliffs out of what was the inside of the mountain. And car-sized boulders have peeled off the cliffs ever since. All that rock, combined with avalanching snow in a crater that doesn't see much sun, is why this is one of the only growing glaciers in the country. This time-lapse model, created by the Cascade Volcano Observatory, shows a glacier advancing down the mountain at times up to three feet a day, just since 2004. This at a time when glaciers nearly everywhere else are shrinking. I'm worried about these sleds sliding down into that hole. Me too. After an hour of climbing, Eddie's team reaches the opening they hope will lead them inside that glacier. They call it the Godzilla hole. This is the largest entrance that we located. We actually saw it from an aerial reconnaissance. We actually don't even know how deep it is. But we're thinking just based on glacier depth, a 300-foot rope should cover it, unless it's a big surprise. There's no guidebook. There's no uh, beta from your buddy who climbed it last year. Uh, so. Uh, going a little bit slower and, and thinking through all the potential things that could surprise us. Okay, so are we ready? Have you been checked or safety? Yeah. All right, here we go. Eddie leads a small team, including Jared Smith, Craig McClure, and photographer Eric Guth, down a two-stage descent. Down, please. First, down a steep 100-foot funnel. I can see the bottom now. Rope! Then it's a free hanging drop into a pit filled with a threatening swirl of vapors. Look at the size of this thing. Oh, it's overhung, all right. All right, I'm going. Down, down. Yeah, keep going down. Down. For the first drop, we were pretty unnerved because we didn't know what, what that gas was. You know, that could have been hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, anything like that. We got people set up everywhere ready to yank me out of the hole. Keep going. Down. But the air tests safe. Okay, Barb. Thanks. And Eddie's soon joined by the others in an 80-foot high ice cathedral. These are the first images ever recorded inside this cave. That is awesome! When I stepped foot in this cave, I mean, it wasn't a step, it was a dangle. <laughs> kind of spinning in that oblivion for a little while. And that was, that was awesome. So to enter it in the fashion that we did was just breathtaking. Yeah, being here, yeah, it just, it, it fills you with life force. Yeah, it just makes you feel alive and you're happy to be alive. <laughs> Turn your monitor on. It's just, it's clear in here. We got 20.4 oxygen. Woo! And check out this room. The team moves deeper into a steep, dark passage. No one knows where this goes. The discovery of this cave has special meaning for Jared Smith. It was Jared who initially spotted Godzilla Hole while on a climbing trip. I've been looking at these holes for many years from the rim and uh, always wanted to come down and just check them out. You know, I didn't want to do it illegally. I just sat down and then took it in for a minute, took a few photographs, and it was, I was in awe. It was beautiful. One of the objectives of this trip is simply to document this new discovery. This is one of the biggest caves I've ever been in, without question. Eric Guth has photographed glacier caves from Alaska to Patagonia. For me, the draw is, is beauty. It, it just all starts from, from beauty. There's something about knowing you're going to be one of the only people to ever photograph something like this, and if someone returns, it's not going to be the way it was when you were there last time. 
As we finally start to make our way out, Neil Marchington makes an unusual discovery. It's a young tree growing in darkness. So we're collecting a five needle conifer sapling. You can see the seed pod that it came with. Uh, go like, straight uphill from Barb. Woo, crazy. Hi, this is Brent. Hey, Brent, it's Eddie up here in the greater Mount St. Helens. How's it going? Oh, good. Eddie, how are you guys doing up there? A long day of surveying and... There's a bittersweet side to this trip. Eddie's longtime caving partner, Brent McGregor, was injured while scouting for this Mount St. Helens trip. Instead of leading the expedition, he agreed to be our link to the outside world. So what is the forecast? Yeah, I guess if you can read it off starting tonight. Tonight, they're calling for rain with a low around 47. New precipitation amounts between a quarter and half an inch are possible. Okay. On Wednesday morning, clouds build below, but in the crater, it's all sunshine. We take advantage of the clear weather to make an early start towards a new cave about a quarter mile from the Godzilla hole. Yeah, watch your step here. It doesn't have a name yet, so we just call it Cave 2. And the team soon finds it's a lot more confined than the Godzilla hole. Is everything okay? Everything good. On the surface, Dr. Woody Peoples has everything he needs in case of emergency. This is my large medical kit. But he's growing increasingly concerned about gas in the caves below. It's unnerving. I know that Eddie is an excellent caver and he's got a lot of experience and they have the monitors. Problem is they're all in the same place at the same time. And if they start to get into a situation where the hydrogen sulfide is high, getting out of there could be difficult before they become overcome by the gas. Right now our O2 levels are at 20.4 and nothing else is registering on the reader. So we're safe to travel through. It's definitely steamy in here, so it gets a little warmer the further down we get. Every minute spent in the cave is another minute exposed to an unnatural degree of risk. So the team works fast as they survey and record the dimensions of the cave. Between Godzilla Hole and Cave 2, they map over 1,400 feet of previously unexplored passages. But they also notice something unusual. These caves are basically dry, unlike what they found on Mount Hood. We kind of naturally expected similar things. Maybe a one big hole and long linear passages with water and waterfalls. But on Mount St. Helens, it's heat from the volcanic core that seems to be sculpting the caves. Wow, really hot right here. Of course, now it makes sense. Steam is going to keep burning its way up until it gets to the surface. So of course, it's going to make these rooms pretty much at the height as the glacier is deep. So the surprises were here that were shorter than we expected, but they were much bigger and taller and a little more complex than we expected. It's just different. It was a surprise. Oh, you okay? I'm good. Over, that would be the crevasse I just pulled this pole out of. The team was in the cave so long, they hardly noticed the clouds moving up into the crater. The expedition hunkered down for what we thought would be a passing storm. The next day, more of the same. And a planned third trip to the caves is put on hold by a relentless wall of rain. It makes everything just a little bit more difficult. And everything's, people are cold and wet, gear doesn't dry out. If someone gets hurt, we don't have the easy evacuation we had. So just the consequence goes up of any hazard. It's about a 10 on a scale of 10. It's getting scale. pretty brutal right now. For a while it was just raining, but now the wind's picked up. If there's any way to get out of here right now, we'd be going. By this point, the expedition is pinned down. There's no trail out of the crater, and the helicopter can't fly when the crater is socked in. The storm only picks up steam as night falls. 
That's when photographer Todd Sonfly turned the camera on himself to report that all hell had broken loose. Okay, I just uh, came back from being outside. It's uh, about 3 a.m. at the moment. Uh, that big cabin tent, uh, it had blown apart and all of their stuff was blowing all over the glacier practically. The next morning, the team managed to salvage a heavily damaged tent that was home for six people. And then our situation went from bad to worse. The helicopter that brought the OPB crew and much of the expedition gear in was not coming back. There's three layers of clouds. You don't need the whole meteorology report. He can't do it. Is it going to happen today? There's another front off the coast that's coming. It's going to actually make things worse later this afternoon. Uh, obviously, now we all have to walk out. Everyone's already wet and cold. And, you know, it, it sucks, but as soon as we start moving, you're going to warm up, and we just need to keep moving. That's why I want packs light. Only take, you know, food, water, things you can't live without for the next two days when you get home. But well, here's how this story ends. You can forgive us for not shooting much more video, but we had to leave thousands of pounds of gear on the ice and undergo a hair-raising evacuation, cross-country and without a trail. Somehow, we all survived. And days later, the helicopter returned for our gear. As scary as this all was, once we made our way out, we couldn't help but talk about returning. Mount St. Helens is one of America's great wonders. And Eddie thinks that somewhere beneath this crater, there could still be up to a mile of caves where no one has ever stepped foot. I feel like it's pumping out more than yesterday. We came up here really not knowing what we were going to find. So the fact that we've gone through the two biggest glacier cave systems that we have identified here in two days was phenomenal. Sometimes the most dangerous places are the most beautiful and attractive from an exploratory standpoint.